Iran and America have been bitter rivals for decades. Iranian lawmakers chanted, death to America. 241 US Marines died in a separate suicide bombing. There have been sanctions, hostage taking, proxy wars, and assassinations. Iran is constantly on the agenda. These have shaped not just the relationship between Iran and America, but much of the Middle East. The rivalry has largely defined the region for the past four decades. So what's behind the feud? And could President Biden help ease decades of tension? If you want to understand Iran's troubled relationship with America, you need to go back to the 1950s, when it all started in a fight over oil. At the time, Iran was home to one of the biggest oil refineries in the world, Abadan. But most Iranians didn't benefit from this vast wealth, as the oil fields were controlled by the British. A British employee showing persons how to shut off the flow of oil now that the tanks are full. This angered many in Iran, and in 1951, Iran nationalized the oil industry. The campaign was led by a nationalist leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, who became prime minister. When Mossadegh uh, came and tried to nationalize uh, the oil, Britain considered this theft. The concern was this, if they allow Iran to nationalize its oil, what is to prevent Iraq, Saudi Arabia and others to follow suit and do the same? For years, Britain tried diplomacy to win back the oil, but talking didn't work. The British needed something more radical and approached America for help. As these CIA documents show, the British persuaded the Americans to join them in a plot. Together, they would remove Mossadegh, and in doing so, change the course of history. British and American spies stirred up violence in Iran, and Mossadegh was swept from power. That experience really was a watershed event in the modern history of Iran. With Mossadegh gone, the Americans needed a leader they could more easily control. So in 1953, they helped reinstall the country's king, the Shah. Iran was an important strategic ally for America, as it provided a buffer against the Soviet Union. And the Americans hoped the Shah would provide access to cheap oil. Iran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. But America's support could not protect the Shah from problems at home. The Shah was perceived as somebody who had been reinstated in power thanks to this coup. So as you can imagine, he was suffering from a crisis of legitimacy. At the appointed moment, the Shah of Persia will arrive. The Shah was hell-bent on westernizing Iran. He introduced sweeping reforms that increased access to education and gave women the vote. But some thought the reforms went too far. Eventually that Western influence would anger a lot of people, uh, including the, the Shia clergy. And then you had the rest of the population, which was just angry with the way the Shah sort of handles his business. He was extravagant. He was corrupt. He cracked down on any dissent. It was becoming clear the Shah's days were numbered. Protesters filled the streets in violent clashes with the authorities. There was one man who embodied the revolutionary movement, the exiled Shia cleric Ayatollah Khomeini. He returned to Iran from Paris in February 1979 and was greeted like a messiah. His return would give the revolution the final push it needed. The revolution really came like a sudden tsunami. It was unexpected and it happened in such a short time span that not even the Ayatollah and his lieutenant expected you know, such a quick victory. Within a few months, Iran had been declared an Islamic Republic, 
which it remains to this day. This was a bitter blow for America, but things were about to get much worse. The Shah had left Iran before Khomeini returned, and months later, President Jimmy Carter allowed him to come to America for cancer treatment, which caused outrage in Iran and paved the way for one of the worst geopolitical fiascos America had ever suffered. The Iran crisis, America held hostage. Landmark reports like this broke the news to the nation. The US embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. Angry that the Shah had escaped justice, students took a group of US embassy employees hostage, demanding that the Shah return to stand trial. The hostages were regularly paraded in front of the cameras. Look at this. One American, blindfolded, handcuffed. That hostage crisis really traumatized the American political establishment and made Iran into a, a very prominent nemesis. It became the poster child for what we refer to nowadays as Islamic fundamentalism. The crisis played out over 444 days. A rescue attempt went wrong and Jimmy Carter failed to win re-election. Meanwhile, trouble was brewing on the country's western border. Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, had taken advantage of the political upheaval to invade Khuzestan, home to the Abadan oil refinery. The Iranians retaliated, and it turned into a gruelling eight-year war. America supplied weapons to both sides, prolonging the conflict. But it mainly tried to sway the balance of power against Iran. For America, it was a chance to, to really sort of stick it to the Iranians. Um, so they backed up Saddam Hussein, did everything they could to sort of tilt the war um, slightly to his advantage. Iran and Iraq attacked each other's ships, so the American Navy started to escort oil tankers in the Gulf and America soon became drawn into direct fighting with Iranian forces. In one incident, an American warship shot an Iranian passenger plane out of the sky whilst under attack, mistaking it for a fighter jet. Both Iran and Iraq suffered huge losses, but on balance, Iraq came out on top. The conflict hardened Iranian attitudes towards America, which still shape Iran's politics today. Iran's current political elite, their baptism of fire happened during that Iran-Iraq war. Their formative years of their life were spent in the war front. So you cannot now blame them for having this security-minded outlook on things. The Iran-Iraq war was only one in a series of proxy wars where America was pitted against Iran. Another was in Lebanon. Israel, a friend of the West, invaded Lebanon in 1982 to push out the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO. Iran intervened in the war to help arm and train a radical Shia militia. Iran doesn't have the military might to fight the US or Israel. The only way Iran can have an advantage is through asymmetrical warfare. And this is where proxy groups become handy. America and other Western countries were drawn into the war, and Iran-backed suicide bombers attacked Israeli and Western targets, including the US embassy and a marine base in Beirut, where hundreds of Americans were killed. It was sort of yet another trauma caused by Iran on America, um, it sort of went without retaliation, so it really showed up uh, America's weakness. At the time, the militant group behind the bombing didn't operate under one name, but it soon became known as Hezbollah, or the Party of God. It is both a militia and a political party and dominates Lebanon today. 
Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Hezbollah and other proxy groups carried out multiple attacks on US and especially Israeli targets around the world. But then everything changed. Iran had nothing to do with 9-11. But Iran came to experience the repercussions of the 9-11 attacks. I've never seen nothing like it in my life. By now, Iraq under Saddam Hussein had also become a foe of America's. In the wake of the attacks, America invaded the country to depose him. This was a crucial moment in America's relationship with Iran. And with Americans on their doorstep, Iran accelerated its nuclear program, and America was worried. And Iran had been working to develop missiles. The nuclear threat from Iran was sort of front and center at, at this point. Iran claimed its nuclear ambitions were for civilian purposes, not for weapons. But the West responded by imposing ever tighter sanctions. The sanctions didn't stop the country building centrifuges to enrich uranium which went from zero in 2006 to almost 20,000 seven years later. But sanctions, particularly those on Iran's oil exports, did cripple Iran's economy, pushing its leaders to the negotiating table. And for the first time since the hostage crisis, America too was willing to negotiate. President Barack Obama's administration negotiated a deal with Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA. There were two moderate leaders in each country that both realized, you know, you cannot start from maximalist demands and expect the other one to surrender entirely. The deal was groundbreaking. It limited Iran's nuclear facilities and opened it up to more rigorous inspections in return for sanctions relief but not everyone saw it as a success. Never, ever in my life have I seen any transaction so incompetently negotiated as our deal with Iran. President Donald Trump withdrew from the deal in 2018, reimposing sanctions under a policy of maximum pressure. Once again, raising tensions in the region. It convinced the Iranian hardliners that you can never trust America's words. People really did suffer, and this gave America tremendous leverage, but Donald Trump didn't really use this leverage to any end. In fact, by the end of Donald Trump's term, Iran was closer to a bomb than at the start of it. President Biden has already indicated he would like to rejoin the JCPOA. The only way out of this crisis is through diplomacy. But the road ahead is far from certain. Iran will elect a new president in 2021, who is widely expected to be more hardline than his predecessor, making any end to the feud even more unlikely. The irony of this rivalry is that American society and Iranian society are much closer to each other than, say, American society and Saudi society. But their leaders are held hostage by history. So as much as it would be somewhat natural for America and Iran to have this rapprochement, um, it's going to be very difficult to bring about. I'm Roger McShane, the Middle East editor for The Economist. If you want to read more of our coverage on Iran, please click the link. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.